All right. So Catherine said that she wanted a talk on tree problems. So I'm going to talk um, about some of the more common abiotic um, problems. And if we have time, we can always get into the biotic tree problems. Um, my understanding is this was 1130 to one. So if that's not correct, uh, let me know. Uh, if y'all have any questions, um, since y'all are in the classroom, uh, maybe Catherine could put them in the chat if you uh, want to ask questions or you know, raise your hand and then I'll stop talking. Um, I should, I, I tell everybody this, it's fair warning, but I'm working from home and I have satellite internet. So uh, I have a little bit of a lag time. So just tell me to stop talking and and because you want to ask a question. So that'll be great. Did you have anything, Catherine? Nope, it's it's your show. So go ahead and and run with it. <laughs> Okay, sounds like a plan. All righty, so we're going to talk about tree problems, some of the common ones that we see, and maybe a little bit about, um, you know, as I said, the abiotic problems. So I'm going to start going through uh, the program. We'll talk about anthracnose a little bit. Um, this is uh, several groups of fungi. It can be, uh, a lot of times we see it on ash, but there are other tree species that we see this on. Uh, it can be confused with oak leaf blister. Um, and you can see um, anthracnosis, there's, it's pretty random symptoms. They're not distinctly round or any particular type of shape. So uh, it looks a little bit like this and, uh, you know, kind of, it may affect some leaves versus others. It just, you know, it's a foliar, disease. So it's not really going to cause a whole lot of damage to the plant. It's mostly aesthetic. However, if we don't do proper sanitation at the end of the season, growing season, then we can see a uh, reappearance the following year because we leave the leaves on the ground and the fruiting structures of anthracnose um, will produce spores that can get uh, blown up onto the leaves. And so that can cause some problems as well. So again, you can see um, the necrotic lesions here, the, the dying parts of the tissue. And again, there's no specific pattern. It's kind of really random. Um, they're very irregular, really blotchy. And um, this one is on an oak. So you can see the damage that's caused by that. So it's actually, you know, really, um, really interesting. These are the fruiting structures. These are called acervuli. Uh, and they produce these little, I don't know, they're called CD. And so far, we've not really figured out what their purpose is. Uh, I suspect it's probably to allow the spores to be able to uh, leave the acervuli and be able to get around. And it may be uh, protection for the fungus uh, so that it doesn't, you know, uh, birds don't feed on it or something like that. So I don't know. Uh, scientists don't know. <laughs> they haven't really figured this out yet. But they come in uh, different colors, but they all have the CD. Uh, and then these spores get blashed around, splashed around to other leaves. Generally, we'll see the symptoms start, oh, probably about now. Uh, the leaves are infected when they first start uh, developing, when they first start, when the trees first start leafing out. And then as the summer moves along, as the temperature warms up, we start seeing the symptoms a little more uh, and they're a little more prevalent. So, but again, uh, good sanitation is, is important because we can, uh, you know, clean up any of that leaf debris that has uh, these spores that can overwinter. And so then we can reduce our potential inoculum the next spring. So again, the damage is minor. Uh, it likes this cool, wet weather that we're having. Uh, I don't know about you, but the last couple of days have been pretty cool at my house. Um, I know it's been really hot along the front range. Um, I'm not sure what the temps have been in uh, Cheyenne, uh, so or you know in Laramie County. So it, it's really kind of uh, temperature dependent. But again, good sanitation. Now, if you want to, if you've had anthracnose in the past and you want to do some sort of protective uh, fungicide, like a general protectant, uh, before the trees leaf out, uh, that can be done. 
uh, you can do that. You can apply a general fungicide at leaf emergence and then repeat it every year. Um, and, uh, you know, or every, I'm sorry, not every year, but you can repeat it every uh, 14 to 21 days as long as the weather is cool. Now, the most common tree hosts that I've seen this on are ash and oak as well. So, um, but there may be other plants like, um, let me go back here. Like uh, this, I believe is, um, I don't remember what plant this is. It looks kind of like a, like uh, a, willow. a poplar species. Hello, uh, or a willow species. Like a willow. And this is an oak and this is an ash. Yeah, thank you. It, it, that's what I was trying to, I was thinking, is it willow or like there's some uh, uh, more narrow leaf uh, poplars uh, that could potentially get anthracnose as well. So, um, but the most common that I've seen it on are ash and oak. So tephrina is a, uh, another fungal pathogen that we see occasionally. This is, uh, occurs on oak trees. It's called uh, tephrina curulescence, and it's the oak leaf blister. If we see it on peach, it's called tephrina deformans. It's a peach leaf, uh, peach blister. And then in plums, it can cause plum pockets, and that's tephrina prunet. So again, you get this blistering or curling of the leaves, but when these blisters start uh, aging and maturing, they start turning brown. And so the symptoms will often look like, uh, let me see if I can find an older picture. They'll often look like anthracnose once these start, um, start turning brown. And so that's why sometimes it's kind of hard to tell the difference between tephrina and, um, and uh, anthracnose, especially on oak trees, because they're the same host. I mean, it's the same host that can affect um, that can affect oak trees, or you know, anthracnose and also um, uh, tephrina can both affect oak trees. So, but you'll see these like this blistering on the leaves, the plum pockets tephrina. Um, actually, the fungus replaces it well it doesn't replace but it it doesn't allow the fruit to form the seed and so it causes the pockets inside the plums and so the fruit gets deformed it's mushy uh it's not edible and so that can be a huge problem as well uh this again uh it, it's considered a naked assay meaning that it has the those the assay that are produced on the leaf surface and it produces these ascospores that can uh emerge from these assai and can get blown around to other leaves. In uh, peach orchards, of course, uh, peach leaf curl is really, uh, can be a problem. And so they do treat for this uh, prophylactically to make sure that, you know, it doesn't affect the, the plants and so they can still get a good harvest. So this is the peach leaf curl um, on peaches as well. And um, this particular fungus, because it can survive uh, in the bud scales on the plants, this is one of the reasons why they go ahead and treat peach trees early spring before the leaves start coming out. Um, and so that uh, it can actually treat that uh, plant and so the fungus can't survive. And so the fungus can, uh, won't be able to infect the leaves as the tree is starting to leaf out. Um, it only has one infection cycle per year. Uh, so again, if you can use that um, dormant fungicide application right before bud break, even on oak trees, if you've had oak leaf blister before, you could use that. Um, there are some coppers that, that you can use. There's also some other uh, synthetic type fungi that you can use as well. But uh, this is the best way to manage that as well as, you know, good sanitation. But because the fungus survives in the bud scales, then consequently, you know, good sanitation isn't the only thing that that needs to be done. Uh, there are fungicides that that can be used for this. Okay, slime flux or wet bacterial wet wood alcohol flux. This, of course, is a bacterial infection that increases the moisture or and gas in the xylem and also in the heartwood. And so you can see when it builds up enough pressure in there, 
it starts uh, pushing that infection out. And so it looks oozy. It, you know, we call it slime flux. We call it bacterial ooze, uh, different things like that. Mostly we see this associated with poplars, willows, elms, and some true firs as well. So the um, uh, true firs like the, um, uh, I want to say, I want to say Abies, but I may be wrong. Tara, you can you can um, correct me if I'm I'm incorrect with that. But um, again, it causes the oozing that comes down the trees, and there seems to be several bacterial species, uh, several bacteria that are involved in this, as well as uh, a yeast. So they think that there's some yeast also involved with this as well. And Tara says. Abies is right. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So, um, and yes, true. This is true. Ashes can get it. Um, this is, you know, by no means an exhaustive list, but um, usually where we see it are trees that are somewhat faster growing than uh, the slower growing trees. So like oaks that are a little bit slower growing, I don't usually, I don't see a uh, bacterial wet wood associated with those but trees that are really uh fast growing that you know people uh plant these because they can be um that can be um these tend to be the ones that are more associated with back uh this bacterial slime or the bacterial wet wood uh globe willows are you know a real popular choice over on the western slope of colorado and they get bacterial wet wood all the time so they're also very susceptible to cytosporic canker But yeah, it's, um, yeah, really good. So again, you know, different species. This is what it looks like in the wintertime after the trees have, you know, gone dormant. Uh, the slime flux dries on the bark and it usually leaves this lighter color associated with that. And so that's how you can recognize, well, this tree has bacterial wet wood. Now, can we do anything for this? Eh, probably not, no. It can, oops, it can discolor the interior part of the wood. So uh, it, the, the wood would be of less value if you were going to harvest it for say lumber, you know, like uh, making, you know, lumber coming out of it. But it also, um, there's really nothing that you can treat with it. You know, you just have to make sure that you can reduce the stress on the trees itself so that um, hopefully they can survive a little bit longer. But, you know, it could be, you know, injuries, wounds, uh, branch crotches that are not sealed correctly, or, you know, they have a, a weak, uh, weak um, uh, union there at the branch crotch. And uh, they may, you know, it may also come from root damage associated with that, allowing the bacteria to get into the roots. So again, you know, just it's one of those things that we kind of have to live with. There's not really any management that we can do. So the trees susceptible to this, um, the ones that get heartwood infection are going to be elms, cottonwoods, poplars, box elder, Russian olives, ash trees. The ones that have bark and cambial infections are going to be willows, mountain ash, the uh, sorbus species, aspens, poplars, mulberries, and maples. And of course, these are the most susceptible, so not probably a complete list of all the trees that can get uh, bacterial wetwood. So slime flex slime flux, slime flux, bacterial wet wood. I'm just going to go with that, right? Slime <laughs> flux is kind of a tongue twister. So, so you can see this right here. You can see it on this elm tree. These are some of the elms on the CSU campus. You can see the bacterial wet wood that's come down the tree here. And you can also see the darkened area here. This is city mold from uh, elm scale that is on the tree as well. So uh, you can see the bacterial wetwood, the residue that's been left behind for these. This, this picture on the right though is actually the uh, Fort Collins Cemetery. This one on the left is the CSU campus. So you can see the uh, slime flicks or the bacterial wetwood right there. A globe willow, uh, you know, traditionally, you know, people like these globe willows because they have this nice rounded shape, but you can see the bacterial wetwood uh, associated on this globe willow as well. And here it's just oozing out. This is why they also say that yeasts are involved is simply because it causes this fermentation. And so uh, think about yeast in beer or wine and it causes the uh, 
you know, the liquid to ferment. And that's basically what it does inside the tree. It causes those, that bacterial and, you know, the, the fluid that's in the xylem to ferment. And then it just gets pushed out because there's so much pressure uh, from that fermentation process. Here it is on cottonwood. You can see the, the bacterial wetwood here. You can also see it uh, in these branch crotches where it's gotten to be pretty, um, uh, there's not a good union there. There's a wound or something. So uh, we can also see that bacterial wetwood there. So again, how do we manage this? Again, you know, water stress management is good. Uh, making sure that the trees are not stressed. Uh, most trees will live for many years with uh, bacterial wetwood. We don't really treat it. There's no real treatment for it. Uh, pressure relieving tubes are not recommended uh, because basically what happens is if you drill a hole in that tree, you're really creating another area for the bacterial wetwood to come out as well as another hole for other organisms to get in there. And so you really don't want to, you know, create more problems for the tree. So again, making sure that uh, you're just trying to relieve the stress on the trees is your best bet for uh, managing bacterial wetwood. So moving on to Marsanina, uh, this is a fungus that affects primarily aspen, but it can also affect walnut, birch, and linden. Um, cottonwoods, poplars are the most susceptible, and generally we see it on aspens, um, where we get these dark brown flecks um, that you know will seem to enlarge. They'll grow a little bit bigger. The spots can merge together to start forming these blotches. So this is pretty typical of Marsanina leaf spot uh, symptoms. This is what you would normally see, kind of these random spots on the leaves. Uh, you would see these particular, uh, you know, little dots that these little spots here that are going to coalesce. They're going to grow together. But again, you know, it's it's very common on aspen. Sometimes these spots can have a white center. These uh, right here is a good example of that. Uh, and that's just the decaying or the necrotic tissue is happening. So um, basically what happens is it causes reduced size of the leaves. They're, they don't get to be as big as they normally would. Uh, they might be shed prematurely. But again, this is an aesthetic problem. It's not going to kill the tree. It's, that's very rare. Um, however, you know, if it comes back year after year after year, eventually it's going to really put a lot of stress on that tree because it may not photosynthesize as much as it needs to. It may not store sugars and food to be able to leaf out properly. And so it may cause, you know, eventual decline of the tree, but it's, it may not outright kill it. Um, but again, good sanitation is critical. This is what the spores look like underneath a microscope. And those spores overwinter on the leaf tissue. And so of course, um, you know, it can reinfect uh, leaves that are coming out or it can happen. Um, if the leaves are left on the ground, that's the initial uh, disease cycle. That's when the spores are released, when the leaves are starting to emerge from the aspen or from the trees. And then they get, you know, rain splashed or wind blown and then eventually cause the problem, you know, cause Marsonina in the tree. But there also can be a secondary cycle. Uh, that happens later in the summer, usually after we get warm temperatures and maybe some moisture. Uh, and those spores can start uh, develop, start developing and uh, then um, uh, splash about or get blown about to other leaves on the plant. So that can be uh, something that we need to look forward to or need to look for, to scout for, if you will. So good management includes sanitation. And you'll hear me say that um, pretty much for everything, right? You know, good sanitation is important, making sure that we're taking good care of our trees, cleaning up all of the leaf debris at the end of the season, um, maybe finding some resistant tree species, uh, if that's possible. As far as I know, there are no resistant poplar species or aspens, so that would be a little bit of a, you know, kind of a hard thing to find. But if you would keep our tree spaced kind of far apart as well, that can help because the spores may not last long enough to land on another tree. So uh, good, um, 
good spacing, good airflow to reduce the humidity uh, so that those spores don't germinate and cause the problem. If, you, uh, if you've had this problem before and you want to treat for it, you can apply fungicides at bud break before the infection. Uh, once the leaves are already infected, there's really, the fungicides are not gonna be that effective. So if you're looking for something, you want something that's going to be um, contact uh, fungicides. So this might be something uh, similar to maybe a chlorthalonil, uh, active ingredient, something like that. But I would double check the label just to make sure that it allows for use on trees and it is uh, allowed to be used for Marcinina leaf spot. So apple scab is another fungus. Um, this is the fungus Venturia inequalis and it happens on uh, apple trees, mallow species. It can be crab apples or you know fruiting apples depending on what your uh, what kind of tree species you have and again you see these necrotic lesions usually along the midrib here uh, associated with that now these spots are not going to be very distinct these are what we call radiate or feathery margined spots and so if you look at them up close they're they're just it looks like they have these little you know it's kind of like uh, you know, there's, there's not a distinct margin associated with these particular uh, lesions. And so this is kind of what we call radiate. And you can see this because it looks like it's kind of growing out from, from that uh, original spot right there in the middle. Uh, it's kind of just kind of feathering out on the leaves. Now, this one needs a lot of humidity uh, to really show up. So if we have a lot of spring rains, a lot of moisture in the spring, this is one that can actually show up, uh, you know, fairly, fairly soon after we get those nice rains and stuff like that. It is aesthetically important. However, if you are uh, an orchardist or you're growing apple trees for the fruit, uh, I would watch out for this one because it can also affect the fruit. And so your fruit would would look something like this, where you get these little scabs all over the apple fruit. So again, the spores for this particular fungus will survive on the leaf tissue. So cleaning up uh, good survival or good sanitation at the end of the season can actually help reduce the, uh, your inoculum potential for the next year. Um, dry weather can help reduce the spread of this pathogen because it does need that high humidity or leaf wetness uh, in order for the spores to germinate. So if we have dry weather, you know, chances of us seeing this are kind of slim. However, you know, in the canopy of a tree, we often can see that, you know, high humidity. So, uh, you know, good pruning practices, maybe to allow for good air circulation in the canopy of the tree can be important as well. So we just, you know, make sure that we do this. There are, I believe, some fungicides that you can use as well uh, at leaf, uh, leaf emergence at bud break. Uh, in order to allow for this. So Cytospora canker, this one is, you know, very common and we see this a lot. It affects a lot of different plants and it looks different on some of these host species. So for example, on aspens, oftentimes we'll see an orange colored bark and it produces these orange cirri, which are these spore tendrils that are being produced from the fruiting structures, the pycnidia. Now on conifers, it looks a little bit different. This is a spruce with, um, with cytospora and the branches will have some gumming uh, associated with the cytospora. And I think I have a really good picture of that to show you. But again, a lot of different host species. We have pop poplars, elms, willows, uh, birches, maple, mountain ash assist and, and, you know, stone fruits can be susceptible to this as well. So, you know, if we start down here where we have the fungus that persists in these fruiting, in the deadwood and the cankers, these fruiting structures are the pycnidia. When it's uh, humid or wet, these spores are released from the pycnidia and they can land on uh, leaf scars, damaged buds, they can land in crotches with narrow branch angles so that there's not a good union there, uh, an unhealed pruning stub, 
uh, winter damage twigs, uh, anything that's poorly healed. And so these get spread about and then consequently those spores will germinate and start forming canker rings. And so it's just a repeating cycle over and over and over again. And this fungus grows in the bark tissue. You can see the margin right here. Um, it can get into the buds as well and cause damage. And what it does is it girdles these stems or the trunks of trees and can eventually kill the branches and kill the trees as uh, warm temperatures and, and, you know, good moisture. So, uh, you know, if you have trees that are stressed, this is a very opportunistic pathogen. And so once the temperature warms up, we start seeing a little bit of moisture, the pycnidia will uh, open and the spores will be released. And then anything that is causing stress on the tree uh, allows that tree to be more susceptible to cytosporous. So anything like drought, uh, late spring frost, insects, uh, other fungal pathogens, any type of defoliation, sun scald, herbicide damage, maybe mechanical injury, you know, all of those can contribute to allowing the tree to be more susceptible to cytospora canker. And this is what it looks like on a spruce tree. This is Cytospora kunzii. And we see the damage here on this. We can see it associated on this branch as well. We can see the overall damage on the spruce tree. And it's kind of random throughout the tree. It's not every branch that is affected. But again, we can see this damage here. Um, on aspen, this is Cytospora chrysosperma or Cytospora nodostroma. And you can see these are the pycnidia that are erupting from the bark. And they're starting to produce the spori in this, or the, the seri in this upper left picture. We see this uh, starting to produce the orange seri. And here we have really brilliant orange seri being produced from the pycnidia in this lower left picture. In the picture on the right, you can definitely see the orange color uh, bark of this particular uh, cytospora canker, you can see it's definitely like this. This is one of those, if you um, are driving in the mountains and you see stands of aspen and you're seeing orange colored bark on the, um, on those aspen, this is, you can do drive-by diagnostics and say, yeah, that's going to be cytospora because it's very distinctive. It really is. It's really, uh, yeah, you'll know it when you see it looking at that. Now, the cytospora nodostroma was actually newly described back in um, like 2000s, mid to late 2000s. Um, and it is very pathogenic on drought stressed aspen, uh, less aggressive in cool temperatures. And cytospora chrysosperma is actually more aggressive in cool temperatures and more aggressive on drought stressed aspen than even uh, cytospora nodostroma. So again, we can see the seri being formed, these spore tendrils, and we can see it here on this. Uh, this was an inoculated tree in the greenhouse that they were doing studies with. So uh, Meg Dudley, she's down at um, Adam State in uh, the San Luis Valley now uh, down in Alamosa. And she did her uh, research on cytospora canker, um, uh, like I say, back in the mid 2000s to late 2000s. So again, you can see just the different types of cankers associated with this. Um, most samples had co-infections. This is cytospora on green ash. This is a prune, prune soa. And not, you know, our ash trees have multiple problems already. Um, they're susceptible to ash bark beetle, um, the uh, emerald ash borer. They're susceptible to the um, uh, apple tree borer, um, carpenter ants, uh, or no, is it carpen carpenter worm, not carpenter ants, carpenter worm, uh, you know, drought stress, all of these things that ash trees are very susceptible to. So, um, we can add cytospora to that list as well. Here's cytospora on peach. This is cytospora leucostoma. Um, Stefan Miller uh, was one of Jane Stewart's students, and he just defended 
uh, his uh, dissertation. And he did his work on Cytospora on peach, and he was looking at different fungicides for Cytospora on peach. And actually, the recommendations that are coming out of that, and I'm sure that his paper will be published soon, is using a, a product called thiophanate methyl that can be used to help reduce the spread of Cytospora canker. So um, that is going to be a new recommendation uh, for uh, peach growers, especially like he did his research over on the western slope of Colorado uh, in the peach orchards. And so, um, yeah, so that's one of the newer recommendations that is that came out of his research, which is really cool because before we were, we weren't, we didn't have anything. We had to tell people that there's no fungicides that can be used for Cytospora canker. But now, um, based on his research, it looks like we've got thiophanate methyl. Um, and there may be a couple other ones in there, um, like lime sulfur or a combination of thiophanate methyl and lime sulfur that can be used um, to help reduce the spread of the canker. So that's really great news if you are, uh, you know, growing uh, peach trees and things like that. So that's pretty awesome. So this is um, uh, another um, Cytospora species. This is Cytospora fugax on um, riparian tree species like cottonwood and willow. You can see here's all the pycnidia on this uh, willow branch on the upper left picture. You can see all these little black dots. These are the pycnidia. So it's actually, you know, you can see those pretty, pretty easily. And of course, we have our canker margin, which is right here. So that's pretty cool as well. Well, okay, I say it's pretty cool. Um, you have to understand from a plant pathologist standpoint, it's really awesome to see all this stuff. But when you're talking to your clients, I have to be careful when I'm talking to clients and saying, um, this is what it is, but I can't say, wow, that looks really cool from a plant pathologist standpoint, because I get all excited about disease and they're all freaked out because something's wrong with their tree. So I have to really dampen my enthusiasm for seeing these pathogens uh, uh, when I'm talking to uh, actual uh, people who have the problem. So, so when I say it looks really cool, I'm talking from a plant pathologist standpoint, and I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that looks really, that's interesting to me. So anyway, so that's just mine. So um, management tools, of course, uh, manage the tree stress remove any of the cankers. Well, and this is always an issue too. How do we remove the cankers? Because if you have the canker in the trunk of the tree, how do you remove that without really damaging the tree? So if you're taking uh, the canker off of the trunk of the tree, is that tree going to survive? Or are you opening new wounds that could be a potential opening for other pathogens that might come in. Now, if you have branches, say here you have this branch that has a canker on it, you could maybe able to prune that branch off. But if you have this area right down here that is, is the canker, can you take that off of the tree? So that's kind of a eh, maybe, maybe not sort of thing. Um, you can reduce the inoculum levels or reduce the spread of the canker by using chemical treatments. And yes, now we do have some of those available. We used to say, you know, um, th there used to be nothing that we could recommend that there was nothing labeled for Cytospora canker that you could use. But now we know that yes, we do. So this is a good thing. And of course, resistant species, uh, you know, there may be some uh, peach trees or things like that, that may be a little more resistant to um, Cytospora canker. Uh, maybe trees that are not as susceptible to Cytospora might be an option, you know, for our landscapes, different things like that. So these are all things that we can look for. Um, how to help your trees resist a, an infection is to make sure that they're healthy. Uh, prepare the soil, make sure that you've prepped your soil. And by that, you know, our recommendations are not to add a whole lot of compost or anything to our soils simply because our soils have a lot of clay in them, especially along the front range. And so if we add too much of that nice compost, uh, you know, loamy soils, the roots aren't going to want to grow out of that very well. So we can amend our clay soils just a little bit, but not a whole lot. We want to make sure that we're fertilizing and watering our trees 
well that we're watering properly and make sure that we can winter water a little bit you know if the soil is not frozen air temperatures are above 40 degrees we can uh, winter water trees and shrubs to uh, help them uh, you know we may think that the trees are totally dormant but technically they're not there is very very little movement of water through the trees during their dormant period but they are able to take up a little bit of that water and it also helps them leaf out uh in the springtime and in the beginning so that you know is awesome for for them to be able to do that and also make sure that we prune properly because if we don't properly prune our trees um we have to you know we leave stubby cuts or we're you know they don't heal as well as they should. Uh, if we prune correctly, they'll heal so that, uh, and pretty much they'll start that callus formation around that pruning cut almost right away. And so it will reduce the ability of spores and things to get into uh, healthy trees. So that's a good thing as well. Um, we wanna slow their growth in the fall. So fertilize in the late winter or early spring because you don't want a whole lot of growth as the tree is going into dormancy. Uh, that allow, that really encourages weak uh, wood. Uh, it encourages any type of vigorous growth in the fall, can uh, allow for you know, broken branches in a snowstorm or something like that. And you wanna make sure that the trees harden off in the fall to reduce the potential for cold damage because we don't wanna see that either. So how we prune trees can also affect cytospora in incidence. So if you prune, if, if you make a stub cut, you will actually get more um, leucostoma, you'll get more cytospora isolated from that. Uh, you'll have not quite as much gumming, uh, but your callus index is going to be 0 0.03, which is really low. So it's not going to form a whole lot of callus tissue there. If you do a collar cut, which is, um, you know, one of the things that they recommend is, is cu cutting at the collar, uh, it calluses over pretty readily. So you have a callus index of 3.1. You might see a little more gumming, uh, but you ha also have reduced cytospora isolation from that and it, or uh, from the flush cut, it's reduced from the stub, but not as you still get more than you would with a collar cut. So with a collar cut at 7.2, you also have um, pretty good callus index uh, and you'll see less gumming than you would with a flush cut. So making sure that we properly prune our trees can be important. So there are some resistant species of cottonwoods that um, might work better than others, like nor'easter, plat, mighty mo, and Ohio red. The Lombardi, Boliana, and Siouxland are very susceptible to cytospora. Um, most cultivars of elms are resistant, as well as hackberries and junipers. Uh, big and little leaf linden are resistant, as well as most maples and most pines. And of course, in Aspen, there are no resistant uh, species or cultivars of Aspen uh, that are resistant to Cytospora canker. So these can be, you know, very helpful recommendations for clients that say, well, I, I want cottonwoods, but I don't want to, uh, I'd rather not have Cytospora. So you could recommend these specific cultivars for them. Or hackberries. Um, hackberries actually are, you know, they're pretty resistant to a lot of things. I have seen some hackberries with um, bacterial wetwood, but for the most part, they're usually fairly healthy. Okay, juniper rust galls. Uh, this is the gymnosporangium species. And again, Rocky Mountain juniper and Eastern red cedar are the most commonly affected of the uh, conifer hosts or the, you know, the um, alternate host and rosaceae species like apples and hawthorns are the most common uh, other hosts for the um, ECL stage of the juniper rust galls. So with gymnosporangium, we see the teleal galls on junipers. They're very colorful. And when they first are coming, uh, showing up in the early spring, uh, they're these Galls are in like in this upper right hand corner. They're very gelatinous. Um, 
and quite colorful, very noticeable, and really, really interesting. So now these galls can also, um, you know, this particular pathogen can also cause galls or brooming on some of the plants as well. They usually don't kill the trees. These galls don't girdle the branches they will dry down and there'll be like these little brown bumps on the branches, but they don't girdle. They will just, you know, kind of continue to grow with the branches themselves a little bit. This is on a hawthorn. This is the Esio stage where you see these orange red spots on the top of the leaves. And then if you look underneath, you'll see what almost looks like a little miniature flower. And so this is the ECL stage and um, you have to have both hosts in order to have gymnosporangium, uh, not necessarily close together. They can be, um, you know, even up to a mile apart um, and you could still get gymnosporangium rust depending on which host species you have. Um, but it's almost like a, a, it's kind of like a, I think it's a two year cycle for these. So for this particular pathogen. So you may always see some part of this particular, uh, you know, or some stage of this particular rust. And again, it likes moist, uh, warm spring weather for spore production. And then the spores blow over to the alternate host. And so we would see, uh, you know, depending on the time of year, uh, early spring, usually we'll see it this way. And then we'll see the telial galls on the junipers. And then towards the middle of the summer, we'll start seeing the ECL stage on the hawthorns or the apples. So again, you know, it's a really, really flashy uh, pathogen, if you will. And fire blight, we have Erwinia amylabra. Again, apples, crab apples, um, ornamental pears, regular pears, mountain ash, um, other rosaceous plants, hawthorns can also get fire blight. Um, really destructive but again, can be a huge problem. Like if you are, you know, if you have apple orchards or something like that, you want to make sure that you're watching out for this one. This particular pathogen, you'll start seeing this shepherd's crooking at the end of the branches. Uh, it's a blight. It's on an, um, you know, apple trees. You'll see this, the leaves will wilt, they'll start to curl up and eventually will turn brown. But then it uh, they'll kind of stay on the branches. They don't fall off. So it's really um, distinctive when you look at it. And here's the, like a later picture, you can see the leaves are turning brown and you see this shepherd's crooking associated with that. Now, sometimes you'll see it as blossom blight as the first symptom. symptom. Uh, then that blossom blight, it then moves into the twigs because, um, you know, the bacteria is in the nectaries of the blossoms, and then it goes back into the twigs itself. Um, so that can be pretty damaging. Now, it's really interesting because, you know, we like to think of bees as our friends, and we want to, we want our pollinators, but bees can actually move this bacteria around from flower to flower, um, and can move the bacteria into those blossoms. And so it can move around the tree and get into those twigs. Um, you can see, again, the shepherd's crooking. This is actually a rootstock canker of, uh, on this bottom picture of Erwinia amylavra. This is a, a holdover canker. And you can see the margin here and here. And you can see this blighted twigs are right here. So again, you know, a lot of different symptoms associated with, um, with uh, uh, fire blight. And it can be pretty devastating. When you see it in a tree, it's pretty distinctive, especially if you see a tree that looks like this. These are called strikes. Um, and because it's moving down the tree and it looks like it was hit by lightning. So it, it causes these, these branches to, um, you know, start declining and things like that. And so it just looks like lightning hit it. Now, fire blight can also really flare up after hailstorms because you are, the branches get damaged and the bacteria can move more readily through the trees. Had no idea. I know it's interesting, isn't it? Um, bees can move the fire blight. Uh, they're in the nectaries and they're picking up back.
criteria. And yeah, it's really interesting. I, I don't think that they're like the main source, but they can move it. So yeah, it's one of those things that's really kind of interesting. And, and uh, you know, we hate to see our pollinators do that. So this is why treatment is also so tricky because, you know, you use an antibiotic to uh, help prevent uh, fire blight, but it has to be timed just right. And it has to be uh, applied at the blossom stage, but you have to make sure that you're not using it when bees are visiting. So it's really tricky to use uh, you know, a, a treatment for fire blight, um, cause it's actually, you know, it's pretty specific, but good comment. Thank you. So again, we can see the cankers here. Sometimes you might see ooze on these cankers, like in this upper picture, in the lower picture here, you can see where the canker margin is right here. And you can see it down here. So there's this area right here. This is a, like a holdover canker. Um, insects can also be attracted to this ooze and they can feed on that and move it, uh, move the bacteria to blossoms as well. So, you know, it's one of those things where, ugh, yeah, a lot of it spreads pretty quickly. Um, the bacteria can move down the tree and cause a lot of problems. So how do we manage fire blight? Again, sanitation to reduce inoculum. Uh, pruning. Now, pruning is really can be a challenge though, because if we're pruning during the dormant season, we have to look for these canker margins right here for both the dormant and actually the growing season. But in the dormant season, if you look for this canker margin, then you need to go, at, I recommend at least 12 inches beyond or past this canker. So if you were going up here and there's and then make your pruning cut up here. Now, the reason I say that is because this bacteria could already be in the vascular system of the plant. It's just not showing canker symptoms yet. So you're trying to go past that canker margin where the bacteria could potentially be and make your pruning cut. Um, and this is why we also recommend that the pruning is done in the dormant season because the vascular system's not moving as readily as it does during the growing season. And so hopefully the bacteria hasn't moved very far. So that 12 inches should actually really be able to um, hopefully eliminate most of the potential bacteria of the fire blight. Now I have had questions on people say, well, I wanna prune during the growing season. If you do that, I highly recommend going 18 inches past this canker margin in order to prune during the growing season. Um, and that's a lot of, that's a lot of tissue you're taking off, but the vascular system is moving that bacteria through the plant. And so we don't know where it is because it does, it's not showing symptoms yet. So we have to make sure that we are monitoring, you know, that we're doing this. And that's why they say, they really recommend pruning during the dormant season and maybe even using some uh, dormant sprays to help reduce the spread of the pathogen as it's moving through the plant. Now there are cultivars and rootstocks of apples that you can purchase that are more resistant to fire blight than others. And so those would be helpful. The, however, <laughs> what's really difficult is to find out, it, you know, if you're just buying from uh, it, you know, if you're buying from a nursery or something like that, they may not know what the rootstock is. Um, so asking them, you may or may not get an answer. Um, but there are a lot of rootstocks that um, could be available, uh, you know, that are available that are, some are more resistant to fire blight than others. And of course, make sure that we're not like fertilizing our plants, our trees a lot so that they don't have excessive growth. Because that really excessive fast growth. It's like all the sugars are going up there. The bacteria has a really good place to move. The, the trees are a little bit weaker. They're not, you know, quite as uh, sturdy maybe or resistant. So again, uh, you know, making sure that we're not using a whole lot of fertilizer on there, but we can use blossom blight sprays. We can use dormant sprays. Uh, you know, there are some chemical protections that can be used as well. So we can do that. The, but you have to be aware that the timing is pretty specific. So if you're looking for a treatment, making sure that you 
are looking at labels of products that you want to use and so that you know you're using it at the correct time. Okay, verticillium wilt is another uh, issue that we see occasionally. This can be either verticillium dahlia or verticillium albo atrium. A lot of hardwoods are susceptible to this maples, catalpas. Uh, I, I've seen it on catalpas a lot. A lot of people um, think that their maples have verticillium as well. Uh, elms, cherry, a, a lot of different shrubs can get it. Really a, a huge host range, right? So uh, this particular pathogen has a huge host range. This is a soil-borne fungus. So it gets into the tree through the roots of the plant. Now, that being said, somehow that those roots have to be damaged in order for the verticillium to get into the plants. Um, and also in the soil, it can produce these microsclerotia, which are the, it's like the resting stage of a fungus, and they can survive in the soil for quite a number of years. They're, they're little hardened structures that um, they're not susceptible to drought or, you know, something like that. They can survive for quite a number of years. Um, now there are some resistant trees like conifers, uh, beech, birch, honey locust, and oak. Of course, you know, beech and birch may not be our first choices for uh, landscape trees along, you know, the front range of Colorado going up into Wyoming. Um, they might not be our best choices, but uh, conifers, honey locusts, and oaks seem to be fairly resistant to verticillium. This is uh, this bottom picture is what verticillium looks like in uh, culture. So if you're growing it out, you can see these little, these little heads right here are the canidia. And it actually looks almost like a little, you know, Christmas tree sort of thing uh, growing in, in the Petri dish. So sometimes the symptoms that we see for verticillium wilt are uh, plants that maybe one or two branches have a dieback, but not the whole tree. Sometimes it may look like this on the picture on the right, where you have more of a whole tree over, uh, you know, looking pretty skimpy and having problems. In the picture on the left, it looks like one or two branches that are affected, not the whole entire tree. And so that's why sometimes verticillium is really tricky to try and diagnose because, you know, it, it doesn't look the same on all the plants. It can just be a branch here or a branch there or something that goes along with that. So you may see some recovery, like partial dieback, and then the plant recovers. Um, you know, this particular tree, I'm not sure I would classify this as verticillium wilt. I would say it's probably having a huge problem with iron chlorosis, um, which is maybe contributing to uh, a verticillium problem because it's all stressed out from the, um, from the chlorosis. But here we have a sumac that uh, is, you know, again, only has some branches, you know, a couple, three branches here that are affected. So again, we're looking at all of this and it's really interesting to, you know, see what's happening and what's going on. Um, and that's why I say sometimes it's really hard to diagnose for the wilt because you see this partial dieback, and, but the rest of the plant looks fine. So when we're looking at symptoms of verticillium wilt, you can get ground, uh, brown to green vascular stains. So when we're looking at the vascular symptom, uh, vascular system, if we do our little you know, knife cuts across a twig or something, we can see things that look like this. This picture on the left, this is our brown staining in the vascular system. This picture in the middle, again, this brown staining associated with that. Uh, this picture on the right hand side, we have this brown staining as well. So, you know, I don't, this might, you might call this in this picture on the left, you might call this a little bit of a green stain up here, but I would be more inclined to look at this brown stain uh, on these particular plants. So this is again, you know, a uh, maple tree, the fungus gets into the feeder roots or the, you know, the water conducting roots, um, or it can get in through direct wounds, root wounds sort of thing. Um, you, if these microsclerotia can survive in the soil for a number of years. And, you know, once they, they can start to germinate and then the fungus can get into the feeder roots. And once it gets in there, the xylem gets discolored. Uh, because verticillium will produce a toxin. 
And so consequently, the tree branch will start declining. It will plug this up. Now, how fast the fungus moves depends on the tree um, and how the tree is built. So for example, this one looks more shrubby. So it's like one branch is affected here. This tree, you have a fairly main trunk. So it's actually looks like it's going up one side of this particular tree on the right. And the symptoms in the crown, you know, when we see damage to the leaves, it's what's that doing? What, what that is doing is just showing us what the damage to the xylem is in the lower part of the tree. So when we start seeing in this picture on the right, we start seeing this um, die back up here in the top. It's actually the result of the fungus in the xylem and it's plugging up the xylem causing a decline of the branches. So trees that are susceptible to verticillium, again, you know, ash, elder, maple, azalea, Japanese elm roses are uh, catalpa, uh, lindens, honeysuckle, things like that. So again, um, you know, making sure that if we have had a problem with verticillium, that we don't plant these trees in that same area because the microsclerotia can survive in the soil. And if you plant a susceptible tree, chances are you're going to have verticillium all over again. So we want to plant some resistant species uh, to help with that. Poplars, spruces, uh, honey locust, hackberry, mountain ash, walnut, pine. Those are all um, resistant conifer and hardwood species that might be a better uh, tree for an area that has had verticillium. We want to make sure that we're not going to damage the roots. You know, don't start, you know, cutting through roots to uh, do different things. Make sure we can avoid that. And also, uh, prune out the uh, infected tissue can help because sometimes it may not have gone to the whole tree. And so we can actually uh, get some of those trees to survive uh, and maybe start regrowing a little bit. Um, so it can do it. Soil fumigants are effective, uh, but they are expensive. And in a landscape, they may not be possible. They may not be labeled for use in a landscape issue. So this might be something that would be used for a tree grower or a tree plantation where they would be able to use a, a soil fume against. They can reduce verticillium wilt, but they don't eliminate it. So it's never gonna be completely gone. So our best bets are you know, planting resistant species for, um, uh, of trees that are resistant to verticillium. Okay, pine wilt disease and blue stain. This is a nematode that gets into pines and the nematode is called Brucephalinchus xylophilus. Um, our native pines are more tolerant. However, they are not completely resistant. I know up here in my area where I live in Red Feather Lakes, uh, there have been several ponderosas that have been diagnosed with uh, pine wilt disease. It doesn't seem to move as fast in the ponderosas as it does in some of the non-native species like scotch pines or Austrian pines, but it does uh, affect them. And so that can be a huge problem. So the scotch pines and Austrians, they're the exotics, they're uh, the primary host, but um, we are finding more and more that uh, the nematode is in, you know, uh, Ponderosa pine, also in Doug fir, uh, some spruce, cedar, uh, larix, and AB species, the first species as well. So again, it's getting to be a big problem. Uh, this is what it looked like. Uh, I believe this was the picture from Fort Collins, one of the first trees that we was that we identified uh, pine wilt nematode in. This picture in the lower right is a picture from um, Kansas when Dr. Tisserat uh, worked there. He did a lot of work with uh, Brucephalinchus, and um, it actually really took out trees pretty quickly in in Kansas, where he was located. Here in Colorado. It, doesn't seem to work that much. And I don't know, Tara, you might be able to tell me if you've found any trees in Wyoming that have pine wilt nematode. I don't know if I've, if any have been diagnosed there. I haven't talked to Bill for a while um, at University of Wyoming. So I don't know if he's been, uh, if he's found any trees that have pine wilt nematode or not. But 
pine-built nematode gets vectored by monocama species. Uh, this is a pine sawyer. Oh, thank you. It's been identified in Cheyenne and Sheridan. Okay, interesting. Good to know. So um, it's vectored by a pine sawyer beetle, which is the monocama species. And I think it's the monocamus carolinensis is the more common one. And what happens is the beetle itself feeds on trees that may have the nematode in it. And the nematodes just kind of migrate into the trachea of the uh, beetle. So when they start feeding, when the beetle starts feeding on other trees, what, it, what happens is the adult sawyers feed on healthy trees because they're feeding on the, the needles at the base of the needles. That's their plant feeding phase. And then those nematodes actually come out of the trachea and get into the feeding wounds on the trees. And so if a plant, if a tree is resistant, then the nematodes will die. If a plant is susceptible, then the nematodes will feed on the tree. They will multiply in the rosin canals and um, then, uh, you know, start reproducing basically. Now the monocamus also lays their eggs in dead or dying trees. They don't lay their eggs in um, healthy trees. So the nematodes that are in the dying tree also get into the Sawyer beetle larva because the nematodes are attracted to the pupa before those adult Sawyer beetles emerge. And so there's really kind of this double whammy here for them um, in, in, you know, for the, for the trees, because then the adult Sawyer beetles, not only could they potentially pick it up in a tree that has nematodes, but they also will, uh, you know, can pick it up or can drop it off into a healthy tree, drop those nematodes into a healthy tree. So it really is um, quite a survival, uh, qu quite a, uh, you know, an interesting way that this nematode actually feeds and gets into trees and things like that. So the needles actually can turn kind of grayish green, then they turn straw colored. Um, the tree changes colors, uh, uh, collapses in a month or faster. Now, they, they found this in to be true in Kansas, not necessarily true in Colorado, because some of the trees that we um, identified in were actually still uh, living. Uh, they did not decline as fast as a month. Sometimes it took them a little bit longer. And we think it might be the cooler temperatures or the fact that the tree species were a little bit different with the Austrians. So, um, and it developed slower in Austrians and Ponderosas, things like that. Um, so again, uh, you know, it, it just depends on um, how, what type of tree it is and when it was um, infected with the nematode. So the pine wilt nematode, it feeds in the rosin ducts and the xylem. And one of the things that Dr. Tisser had always mentioned to me was that the wood of a tree that is affected with pine wood nematode or pine wilt nematode is going to be very, very dry. And that's because the nematode is feeding in the rosin ducts, so it's not producing any rosin. So that wood is going to be extremely, extremely dry. So in Colorado, um, we first noticed this. And as I mentioned, uh, or Tara just mentioned in the chat that they found it in Cheyenne and Sheridan. In Colorado, it was, uh, we first found it in 2006 on a Scotch pine in Fort Collins. Um, in 2011, there were five more Scots pines that were identified. And so this was actually really interesting because it was like five years later, uh, you know, and, and we started looking for it, but uh, didn't find it until again until 2011. Um, in 2012, there were 10 Austrians and 10 Scotch pines that were infected that we identified, diagnosed. And in 2016 and 2017, it was 10 Austrian pines and one Scotch pines. So then the question became, ah, mugos, uh-huh. Well, I think mugo is a, a type of uh, Austrian pine. So excellent. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it was identified in a mugo pine too. Because uh, I remember that sample came from Jefferson County 
and it was positive um, when it came to the diagnostic clinic. Uh, and I don't remember what year that was, but I do. So um, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. And so, um, you know, the question then became, is the, uh, is the nematode in native forest in ponderosa pine? And for a long time, we didn't think it would be. But just this, you know, the past couple of years, they have determined that in ponderosa pine, pinewood nematode can survive and will cause decline of ponderosa pines. So I don't know how aggressive it is in the ponderosa pines. I'm going to say probably not too bad. Um, I know that I, I don't think we have it here on our property in the ponderosa pines, but I know that there are people in the area where I live that have had their trees diagnosed with uh, pinewood nematode. So what do we do for uh, pinewood nematode? The best thing is sanitation. Uh, remove the trees before May 1st, and that is before the uh, pine sawyers will, will be flying or the adults or the adults will be emerging from uh, pine trees. The landfill is best, um, either chip it or compost or burn it right away. Um, don't just turn them into firewood that's gonna sit there because that's a dead or dying tree that the pinewood nematode could still um, lay their eggs into uh, because they, you know, they could survive in that uh, if the trees are not completely dead. Keeping your trees watered, uh, supplemental watering may be worthwhile. Uh, that's going to be a problem in forested areas because ah, we can't water our trees up here, right? Uh, that's not possible. We are not allowed to do that. Uh, so supplemental watering is not, uh, is not something that can be done for our ponderosa pines in my area. Um, so we just have to kind of let Mother Nature take its course. Now, there are some um, products that they were using to inject into trees to prevent mortality, things like abamectin. Uh, and I think it's um, uh, abamectin benzoate. I'm not sure I'm saying that correctly. I can't quite remember. But um, there's a couple products that they can use for tree injections. If you have some you know, really high dollar trees or high value trees that you want to uh, sort of what want want to save and make sure that they're good. Um, we can do that. So, um, and as as usual, uh, you know, Dr. Stewart and and her graduate students are working on uh, some of this to see, you know, if they can kind of map where uh, the pine wilt nematode is. And so they're continuing to work on that at uh, CSU to see what's going on with with pine wilt nematode. So this is, oh, here it is, abamectin and emamectin benzoate. If I'd have just advanced the slides, I would have been able to tell you that. There we go. Um, it's cut, uh, and these get injected. You can inject these into tree under pressure. Now, one of the things I will caution is you just can't do this by yourself. You do have to have a licensed arborist that is trained to do this. And the products will last about two years uh, in the trees. So you do have to redo it uh, to make sure that your uh, that the um, pine wilt nematode doesn't, you know, feed on your trees or things like that, or, or the, sorry, pine sawyer beetle doesn't feed on the trees, and it actually will protect against the nematode developing in your uh, pine trees. So again, um, reduce the populations of the nematodes, and that is, you know, one of the um, tools for that chemical management, ab abamectin and emamectin benzoate. Uh, and also it reproduces or reduces the reproduction rate of that nematode as well. The nematodes, they have to be in the tree. They're obligate. They have to be able to feed on that tree. They don't move easily. They can move within that tree, but again, um, they don't move outside the tree very readily. So chemical use um, is a potential weapon against the nematode, as well as resistant trees. Okay, that was a really fast sort of I'm talking here. Let's listen. So do you guys have any questions about any of the pathogens that we've talked about? Hey, Tamla, this is Catherine. Questions are, about other pathogens. Yeah. Are you going to... Uh 
We're seeing a lot of fungal problems in our pine trees up here in Cheyenne. We've had the, the perfect cool, okay. moist, long duration, cool, moist spring. And so we're now seeing a lot of fungal problems uh -huh. popping up both in lawns and in our pine trees. Do you have any recommendation for treatment on those? Okay. Um, what are the symptoms in the pine trees? Well, the, ne <laughs> the needles are, uh, can be discolored. They can be brown with a red band. They can be red. They can even, even be a little fuzzy looking, a little cloudy looking. Okay. A lot of red, a lot of uh, brown, brownish red. And then a lot of times the needles just fall okay. off, but I am seeing new growth come back on those trees. And right now I'm just recommending that people use a copper okay. sulfate spray. Okay. So are the needles that are falling off the trees, are those like the two, two-year-old needles or three-year-old needles, or is it the new needles that are coming out? Last year's needles, typically. So a year-old needle. But the new growth. Last year's to, needles. Yeah, the new yeah. growth seems to be okay. So, okay, the new growth is okay. That's that's good. Um, I would suspect that this, you know, that the fuzziness on the needles might be a sooty mold. Um, you know, just a saprophyte that's hanging out on the needles. Now, and and that's without seeing the sample because I, you know, I I don't, um, I haven't seen them specifically to be able to do that or to identify whether there's a, you know, a fungus there or not. So, but copper sulfate may help them, uh, you know, as far as um, do people seem to be having pretty good luck with that? Well, I, I tried it on one of my little pine trees and the, uh, uh -huh. for the most part, it seems to be working on one, on one pine tree, all the needles just fell off and then it had great new growth. So that was kind of interesting, but I'm seeing okay. a lot of blue spruce here. <laughs> yeah, that uh, are, are have that reddish hue to them, and and then the needles fall off. But and some uh -huh. of those blue spruce, I'm not seeing any new growth coming out on them. Okay, so, so ha have, have you checked the spruce? Okay, I was going to say maybe on the spruce you might want to check for Cytospora canker too. Um, yeah. Because that might be something that yeah. they're susceptible to, um, especially if they're in areas where maybe they didn't get as much water as they should have. And okay. so that might be something to think about um, to look for some Cytospora canker. Okay. Um, the lawns, I'm not sure, uh, you know, it might be Ascochyta, could be necrotic ring spot. Um, how much moisture have you guys had? Well, before today, we were about three inches above normal and it's raining right now. Oh, okay. And we're supposed to be getting another quarter to half inch of rain. And I've, I've even heard more for today. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, yeah. wow. Cool. Um, let's see. So excess water, well, that could exacerbate exacerbate necrotic ring spot. Um, are you seeing any mycelium growth or fungal growth on any of the lawns that you're looking at? Oh, yeah, like I've, I've, um, going out yeah. and seeing any? Yeah, I have. I've it seen. might be, um, might, okay, might be dollar spot too. Yep. Um, I, I've even seen, I've even seen melting out this see. year. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a nice water disease too. They like water. So yeah. let me see what I got here. I've got a couple books here. Let me see what I got. Okay. Okay. Those are all vegetables. That won't work. I was going to see if I had any books really right handy. Any of my compendia right handy here. Those are all vegetable stuff. Okay. So no, oh, I can... I'll have to go over to my other bookshelf and look for uh, conifers and, and turf and stuff. Um, That's okay. I just, I'm yeah, just kind of sharing I, I just, what I see. You know, I, I, no, I think that's awesome. And I would, yeah, I'd, I'd look at dollar spot, melting out, 
yeah, they all like water, uh, things like that. So definitely, um, definitely uh, some things to think about. And I would still look at Cytospora on spruce. Um, the pine trees, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, I think, uh, has have you sent any samples over to Bill yet? I haven't. You know, homeowners, they want an, in, they want an answer right then and there on the spot. And so I haven't sent anything over to Bill. Oh, I know. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. I just like, we want to know now, what can we do? <laughs> That's always the case for sure. For yep. sure. For sure. Okay. All righty. Okay. Do you want me to continue on with abiotics? I may not be able to get through the whole thing by one o'clock. Um, how That's are you fine. guys doing for time? We're, we're okay with time. So yeah, abiotic disorders are always entertaining. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody, did, did anybody else have any questions before I move on? Um, anything? Okay. It doesn't look like it. All righty. Okay. So moving on with abiotics. Okay. So when we talk about abiotic problems, um, I just gave you, you know, a lot of information on some biotic issues, which are the living organisms, generally fungi, a couple of bacteria in there. Uh, but now we talk about abiotics and these are things like mechanical uh, damage, environmental stresses, chemical damage. And a lot of times these abiotic problems can look very similar to uh, some of our biotic issues. And so this is why it's kind of hard. Some, it, I'm not going to say it's kind of hard. Sometimes it's always hard sometimes to diagnose uh, problems because we have to look at the overall plant and we have to try and figure out what's going on with it. And oftentimes when we do diagnose a plant with a disease or with a pathogen, a lot of times it's because there was stress on the plant and the stress and the plant was just very susceptible to pathogens that came in. And so, um, you know, it was an abiotic issue to begin with because there's stress on the plant, you know, lack of water, it got cold, you know, different things like that. And then the pathogen comes in and causes problems. So, you know, looking at what's happening can be one of those things, you know, it can be very, very difficult to diagnose. What it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So we try to figure it out. And when we look at our trees, you know, our tree roots need oxygen. Um, they, the trunk flare needs oxygen. And if we look at our trees, you know, back when I was a, a very young master gardener and I was going through master gardener training and gosh, this has been, you know, 20 plus years ago now, um, we were always told that, you know, we should, you know, look at a tree and, you know, where the branches and that's our drip line, right? And so we would water underneath the drip line. And that's all we needed to do was water our trees underneath the drip line and our trees would get plenty of water. Well, we've since learned, and this is where science comes in and it, it's all great. Um, basically, the roots of a tree will go out much further than the drip line. It's at actually, you know, the roots will go out even as tall as the tree is. So it doesn't just stop at the drip line. You know, the roots just don't stop here. They keep going. And depending on what type of tree it is, you know, some can have a pretty good tap root, but the majority of the roots of the tree are going to be within the first 12 to 18 inches of soil. And, you know, there may be some roots that go deeper than that, but our roots are going to be here, you know, about 12 to 18 inches. And so when we water, we want to water our trees to a depth of about a foot to make sure that it gets down to those roots uh, so that the tree is able to take up water. And by deep watering, it also encourages our roots to go a little bit deeper in the soil so they're not susceptible to, you know, soil drying or, you know, cold temperatures, you know, freeze damage, different things like that. So it's really important to make sure that we do this. Now, that being said, we also want to make sure that we don't overwater because it can replace that water. Um, it doesn't allow for a lot of oxygen, oxygen exchange in the soil by the root tissue itself. So that can be a huge problem. So when we talk about tree planting, we want to make sure that we're planting our trees correctly. So we don't want to plant them 
too deep where there's no root flare or too high where there's too much root flare, um, you know, we want to be like Goldilocks. We want that just right depth. Um, so like one to two inches above the soil line uh, is where your root flare should be. So that's going to be ideal. If you plant it like this, where you don't see a root flare, that is going to be too deep. So we want to make sure that we do things just right. Uh, if you plant your trees too deep, uh, these it could be symptoms like early fall color, uh, defoliation, early defoliation, different things like this. Um, and so you want to make sure that we're planting our trees. You know, we put a lot of money into buying a tree. We want to make sure that we're going to treat it correctly, treat it right so it'll grow and it will eventually give us the shade that we're looking for. So you know, when we have, you know, compacted soils or too much water, uh, poor soil drainage, uh, we have, you know, reduced oxygen for the roots and they don't survive very well. So we don't want to do this bathtub thing. Um, I know that used to be a real thing uh, around uh, trees. Let's put this ring around there, a ring of soil or, you know, ring of mulch and then fill it up with water and then it's going to water the tree. But really this displaces a lot more oxygen than it helps the tree. We also want to know what our soil profile is, because for example, if we have sandy soil, you know, there's going to be a lot of pore spaces in here. This is going to be a lot of, you know, water can go through, but we have a lot of oxygen. If we have clay soils like this um, illustration on the right here, water's not going to go through very easily. And we also do not have a lot of oxygen um, uh, you know, exchange in there either because the soil particles are really close together. They're really packed um, tight together. So we have to make sure that, you know, we're watering for our soil type as well. So, you know, some of the um, symptoms that we see with uh, lack of oxygen, uh, we see early fall color, uh, too much water, and that's moving the oxygen out of there. If you see algae or moss growing, it's good, good, good symptom that, you know, uh, too much water is around there. Uh, if you have ducks or geese swimming in your, in your area, that might be too much water as well. So you really want to make sure that, you know, like, like this poor tree, I mean, they planted it and it's not going to survive, right? I mean, it's in the middle of a little pond. That's just, uh, you know, you're, we're setting the tree up for failure. We want to make sure that we don't do that, right? And we have our mulch volcanoes, you know, too, too much mulch. Uh, it should not be packed up against the trunk of the tree. It should be away from the trunk of the tree and then kind of, um, you know, just built up away from the tree. So it's not just right around that trunk of the tree. Because these guys, it, you know, it may not get any moisture down to the roots because the mulch takes it all, or it has too much moisture and it's going to make that bark under that trunk, the, the bark on the trunk really susceptible to splitting or diseases, or it's going to make it really tasty for rodents that would like to live in that mulch. And so they'll feed on that. And consequently, it just, you know, the tree will not survive that. So you want to make sure that, you know, we're not suffocating the tree. Um, and also this mulch could be like, if the tree's not planted correctly, the roots could start growing up into that mulch because, hey, it's easier than growing through the soil, right? So, and then you start taking that mulch away and then the roots are going to die because they're exposed to the elements and to the weather. So this is the improper way, this mulch volcano. This is the proper way to mulch. So we want to make sure that we are looking at, you know, mulching. You have your visible flare here, and then you put your mulch out. Uh, about a two foot diameter is really a lot easy, a lot better for the tree than doing this mulch volcano. Um, one of the things you also want to make sure that we're looking at is, um, I know that garden centers are selling these rubber rings for these rubber like used tire rubber ring mulches. Um, these are not really good for the trees. Number one, there's chemicals that can leach out of there that can affect your tree. They retain a lot of moisture. They don't allow moisture to evaporate. Um, they also retain a lot of heat, which may not be good for the root system of the tree. So three things right there, three strikes, you're out. Um, I don't recommend those rubber, uh, rubber rings at all. They, they, they don't do very well. 
So we also have stem girdling roots. Uh, we can get that from uh, planting, incorrect planting. Maybe our planting holes are too small, too narrow. Uh, maybe there's soil texture differences. Maybe uh, we didn't uh, properly separate the roots when we planted the tree, you know, pulled it out of the container and the roots are going around and around and around. Well, if you just plant that in the ground, the roots are going to go around and around and around and they're not going to grow out. So we want to make sure that we are, you know, when we're planting, we try and alleviate some of that, um, you know, that sort those circling or girdling roots because they can eventually kill the tree. Now, one of the things that we can look for on um, for stem girdling roots is we look and look at the lower trunk. It may bulge. Also, girdling roots, if you look at the trunk, maybe one side is flat, and that's a really good indication of a girdling root down below as well. Uh, you may see some off-color foliage, leaf scorch that looks like this, dieback, early fall color, different things associated with that too as well. So, you know, and just what you can also see it sometimes on the soil surface, you know, on the surface of the soil, you can see these roots that are just kind of growing around and around. Um, and, you know, early fall colors. So this one probably has girdling roots. This tree does not. So um, that can be a huge issue with some of these. And here we, <laughs> we have some really good illustrations. Here's the flattened trunk that I was talking about as well. Um, here's bulging trunk. Here's one that still had the, um, the rope around it as well as girdling roots. And so it really caused that bulging associated with that stem girdling roots as well. So these are some of the things to, to look for if you're looking at your trees to uh, make sure that you're not gonna have a huge problem with that. Okay, lawnmower injury, weed whackeritis, uh, different things like that goes by different names. This is why mulch is really important because then you can't drive your lawnmower up right up or run your lawnmower into the tree or, you know, your lawn care company can't do that or they can't take their weed whacker and, you know, cut into the bark and disrupt the xylem and the phloem. And then we have all sorts of problems. So if we had a mulch area around these trees, it would alleviate this potential problem. Because once you do something like this, you're really disrupting the vascular system and you'll end up with something that looks like this here in this uh, middle right picture where you have the lack of growth. Uh, no leaves are uh, forming on this tree. You get this bulging uh, sort of thing as, is, as in this picture on the right, causing huge problems associated with this. So again, you know, lots of uh, things that, uh, that can go wrong with our plants. Uh, construction problems. Um, really interesting. Uh, you have a, a tree die back here associated with construction problems. Here we have uh, digging to put in an uh, irrigation system, looks like. And they're digging right along this area. And it's probably going to go about two to three feet deep, which is where, where do we say the roots are? 12 to 18 inches, right? So you've just cut right through the roots here. Now, Granted, you may not see any sort of evidence that this ever happened on this tree, or it may be years before the tree will actually show evidence. So this is one of those things where, um, you know, I look at trees on, on the CSU campus and I'm looking at um, some of these trees and it's like, I'm surprised you're still alive actually, because they've dug six feet deep trenches around a hackberry tree right outside the building to install steam tunnels. And it's like, the tree's still alive. I don't know how it's surviving, but you know, sometime maybe another 10 years and it'll start declining or something, you know, it may have enough energy reserves. So some of these things are really interesting and, you know, you have construction areas where they put that you know, foam padding or something around the tree to try and save it, but yet they dig up all the roots all the way around it. So you're kind of going, um, wow, you're not, you're, you need to protect the roots as well as the trunk, right? So thinking about all those things. But these are good questions to ask because sometimes you can see, oh, wow, they, 
you know, put in a sprinkler system at this house. And so they cut all the roots of the trees. So no wonder the tree's not doing well. And so sometimes that's the way to look at it too, is, you know, how long ago was construction done around that tree? Some things that we can see too are, you know, cold and dry. Um, trees are slow to leaf out. We see some frost cracks. Um, a couple of years ago, there were maybe more than a couple of years ago, there were ash trees uh, or was it ash or poplar trees in uh, Boulder County that were, that just started dropping their leaves midsummer. And we had had a really nice moist spring. So uh, the trees put on a lot of growth and then it got hot and the spigot turned off, no more rain, right? And so the trees just started dumping their leaves because, hey, we don't want to support all this. We don't have enough energy to feed all the leaves. So we're just going to get rid of them. They abscised their leaves. They fell off. And it's a coping mechanism for the tree because they want to, the, the trees want to survive. I don't mean to anthrop anthropomorphize them, but, um, you know, they can only support so much growth. And so they're going to get rid of whatever else they, they don't need. So that's always something to think about as well. So drought, this is on everybody's mind, um, especially here in Colorado. Uh, the western half of the state is way below normal. It's in extreme drought. It's, in, you know, that super, if you go to the um, drought monitor that's run by uh, University of Nebraska, uh, you can Google that and it will show you what your uh, drought situation is for your state because they monitor, you know, uh, rain, snowpack, different things like that. And you can look at that. So you can um, go into there, that drought monitor and see what's happening. Now, um, here in Colorado, like I said, the whole western half of the state, southwest, um, is in drought. We're already, we already have, I was reading an article this morning that there's already five fires here in Colorado that are causing a lot of smoke damage. Uh, one of them is in um, Northwest Colorado, and I can't remember where the other ones were, but we're already starting to see um, issues with uh, fires uh, associated with drought uh, because of the lightning strike and things like that. And, you know, last year we had the Cameron Peak Fire, which, was, which is now the largest uh, wildfire in Colorado history. Um, and I was evacuated uh, for that, had to leave home for three weeks. But it was one of those things where, yeah, you know, it's, um, they think that that was human cause, but they're probably never going to be able to find the person who started it. So just letting you know, drought is a really serious topic around here. <laughs> so, and, and we see it all the time. Um, if our plants are drought stressed, we're going to see wilting of our leaves, we're gonna see wilting of our candles, the new candles on, on our conifers, uh, wilting uh, on our maples, different things like this. So, you know, it really, really, we, see, we can see what happens when we don't give our plants water. And granted, sometimes we may not be able to. Like I said, I'm not allowed to water trees up here. Even though our property is a horse property and we have extra water, we have water to be able to, you know, use for livestock. Um, I actually use it more for my garden than I do for my trees so I can grow vegetables. But, you know, some people are not so lucky up here that they, they, they can do this. We also see a lot of scorched leaves associated with drought. Now, when we see damage that looks like this in this left-hand picture, um, this is a linden. And the damage, the scorching is pretty even all the way around the margin edges of the tree, right? So we see this, that's pretty easy to determine that, oh yeah, that's leaf scorch associated with heat and drought. And it's not because the plant may not be getting enough water, it's because it may be that it's transpiring so much that it can't bring enough water up through the roots of the tree to replace what's being lost. Uh, through transpiration, right? It could be where it's located. You know, you have this tree here, and this is a linden tree. You can see this. It's right next to an asphalt paved driveway. So you see 
there's going to be a lot of residual heat here. There may be, I think this is a school as well, so there may be a lot of traffic going across this area where the tree is located, and so it's compacting the soil, so maybe there's not enough water able to get up to this particular tree. So it's just, you know, constantly under a lot of water and drought stress. And here again, we see this is on an apple tree. We can see these, this pretty even scorching around the edges of the leaves. This is on an elm. Again, you can see that here and you can see that scorching associated with this is, um, uh, these are elm trees that are along College Avenue here in Fort Collins, and you can see the damage, the residual heat from the concrete, um, as well as the sidewalk causing a lot of damage associated, you know, just scorching of the leaves because it's, they're not getting enough water. Sometimes we can see gamosis. Um, this is a picture that Laura Podorf took, and I have emailed her to ask her where she took this picture and how she knew it was associated with drought and not associated with a pathogen. Because oftentimes we associate gamosis like this with um, cytospora canker on prunus and, uh, you know, like prune, uh, like cherry trees and also um, peach trees. So again, um, I'm, I'm not sure where this picture came from. Um, I haven't been able to get a hold of her yet. She switched jobs, so she's no longer with the state of Colorado. And so I need to email her at her new position and see if she has an answer for this. So if you have a question on this, um, hold it and I'll try to get an answer for you. So again, dieback by prolonged drought uh, on a spruce tree. Uh, also on uh, this, I think is a Doug fir or true fir. I can't tell just right right close. But we also see um, dieback associated with that as well. Now, sometimes on spruce trees, we can see this and it's associated with wind damage. Some of the branches may be too close together and we get those heavy winds or those, you know, a lot of wind coming through and the branches rub together and it just can rub the needles off. So um, if it's just rubbing the needles off, they may come back, they may produce new candles the next year. Um, but if it's actual dieback uh, because of drought, then, you know, this could be pruned out and that would be, that would be fine to be able to prune that out. So drought on tree diseases and insects, basically drought actually will predispose trees to a lot of secondary insects and pathogens. And we can say that, you know, with pretty good confidence that a lot of times when I was doing um, diagnostics, I would see insects and pathogens, but it was because the trees were already stressed out. So there were either drought stress or coal damage or something like that. And so we see all of that uh, associated with plants. And so if we try to alleviate some of those problems, those abiotic issues, then we can reduce a lot of the secondary insects and pathogens that may come in and, and start causing even more damage for the trees themselves. So, you know, if we reduce the stress on our plants, hopefully we can do that a lot, a lot better. Um, a lot of trees that are drought, um, drought can increase the susceptibility to canker problems like cytosporas or um, thyronectria on honey locusts and different things like that. And also a lot of root diseases. Uh, associated with drought as well. And then wood borers and bark beetles, of course, that is definitely, there's been, there's a lot of research to show that wood borers and bark beetles um, can really uh, be a, a, a huge problem for drought stressed trees. So soil compaction, root damage, um, watering for the grass and not the trees. This is why uh, when you have, if you have a tree in a lawn, you should water for the tree as well, because the trees need deep watering, uh, not just that shallow water typical for watering for grass. But if you water deep for the trees, then you're also encouraging the roots of the grass to grow deeper too. And so it will be less um, drought stressed and it will be more drought tolerant. Um, so that is also a, a good thing to think about as well. So um, soil compaction, root damage associated with all of that, uh, those are all things that, you know, we we need to think about as far as uh, making sure that we're not predisposing our plants for 
uh, to more damage than than we need to. So how do we manage this? You know, the correct site, uh, the correct species for the site, for the location. You know, the right plant in the right place uh, that can help um, improve the root grower growing area. You know, put a mulch in there so that um, the soil can retain some of that water. It doesn't evaporate right away. Um, better soil prep in the landscapes. But again, we don't want to do too much of the, um, you know, super fluffy soils because we want our trees to grow in the native soils and be able to survive in the native soils as well so that they don't, you know, have those girdling roots and different things like that. And then also water the trees, making sure that you water to a depth of 18 to 20 inches, um, you know, at least 12, you know, but if you could get down to 18, that would be great, because then it encourages those roots down there to, you know, get, grow a little bit deeper into the soil, as well as pull up um, some water and, and different things like that. Okay, other environmental problems. Um, let me see what we have here. It is 1258. Oh, very good. A lot of gamosis on choke cherries in Cheyenne. Um, do you think that's drought related or is that going to be a disease issue? Um, because uh, prunus, the choke cherries are prunus, so they are susceptible to maybe a cytospora canker that could potentially be causing the gamosis. <laughs> okay, good. Well, thank you, Tara. Excellent. Okay. All right. Catherine, do you want me to continue? Keep let going. Ask, yeah, let me ask the group here. What do you guys want to continue on? Are you ready to go? Or okay, we do have a couple people that need mm -hmm. to go back to work. <laughs> okay. We're already at work. So you know what I can do. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, what I can do is I can send you a PDF of the presentation so they could look at the rest of the slides if they want to, um, okay. talking about uh, some of the sun scald and cold damage and different things like that. If you if you wanted to share that PDF, that'd be okay. Okay. I can would, do that. That would be perfect, Tamla. How's that? All right. Okay. Awesome. Great. Does anybody have any questions before we all go? I think we're good. I'm sure we have questions, but we'll okay. have those questions once we get out in the field for sure. But Tamla, I want to sure. thank you for taking Absolutely. time out over your lunch break to do this. As it, oh, you're welcome. No problem. Yeah, it, it helps me get the rust off and do better diagnostics mm -hmm. and it helps everybody here be able to recognize that something may be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand. I yeah. understand. It can be a challenge. But yeah. Yeah. well, thank you all for uh, I'll stop sharing here. So thank you all for joining today. I appreciate your attention. And I, I hope this was good and good for you all. And I'll, like I said, I'll send Catherine a PDF so that you can have reference for this. Okay. All right. Again, thank you, Tamla. You're welcome. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks, Tara. Yep, bye. Bye.